there are questions that are unanswered. And those are research questions that are required by all stakeholders that have an interest in these, I'm still going to call it carbon rich landscapes, because if we're thinking about the importance of a terrestrial landscape being storing carbon, we can have a whole variety of different types of soils that store carbon, although peatlands do it most effectively. Um, so I thought it would be interesting if we had a discussion about whether people who choose to disturb that landscape in many different ways should actually be thinking about how they can have some of the questions answered that um, are the questions that we end up debating so much. And I've listed some of these questions. Um, so the first thing that, that we've had a lot of focus on wind farms and, and to me these are the type of questions that are actually coming out of the discussions that we've had. So what is the recovery time? We don't have sufficient studies to actually tell us what the recovery time is at the moment because it's a relatively new um, process that's taking place. And within this is nested information that's required about vegetation response, the water table and the extent of drainage. So Peter just showed us this morning the smoothing technique that they're thinking of introducing to try and um, basically change what is a hummock and hollow type environment <coughs> drainage still going through these channels into something that's flatter and try and raise the water table um, to a higher level, which would encourage the type of vegetation that we want to have. <coughs> we consider some examples of a functional peatland in terms of carbon sequestration. And um, then we are learning about drainage, but not an awful lot about gas emissions. And this was the reason that we wanted Mark to come and give this talk today. So this knowledge exchange network is carbon landscapes and drainage. And part of the reason that, that we focused on drainage is because it's actually much simpler than looking at gas emissions. And it's a really important point um, to be made here because if we move towards a situation where we're trying to get our peatlands counting towards some sort of carbon credit system, and we may have to therefore start doing big budget measurements to justify the claims that we might make about how these peatlands are acting as sources of sinks or carbon, we need to know about the gas emissions. And then we're looking at problems of spatial variation, fetch, whether you're doing small scale chamber measurements that Mark showed photos of, or whether you're using an eddy covariance system to actually measure the amount of gas that's coming off. So, so certainly we're focusing on drainage, but there are many people out there that are working in gas emissions, and if we were to upscale that to large scale, um, how important is conservation in returning that peatland, and therefore what happens to gas flux? This is a really big area. We haven't really talked about it, but I know that within the development and regulator community, there's a lot of conversation about what's actually happened to peat that is removed from the site and stored in the borrow pit. And I understand that both um, communities would like to be able to comment on that uh, with more certainty, I think is the case. And to my knowledge, there is no research on whether the peat that is stored in uh, an excavated area functions as a peat body or not. And then we had the discussion yesterday about roads and how significant are the roads, okay? And then Jane just brought up the point about what actually happens in re-wetting. So if we think in some ways that peat, when it loses water, will never behave like peat again, if you're actually taking it down to the mineral layer, then if you re-wet it, does it act like peat or does something different happen? And we don't actually know that. I don't think there is research on what would happen there. And then this point here, um, wasn't actually brought up, but you only need 4% of methane to equate to 100% of CO2 in terms of global warming potential. Sorry? It's a time scale thing because methane yep. comes out of the atmosphere faster, it's over a period of time that 4% to 100%, and that's about 100, 150 years. So in these long term systems, you do need to relate that figure to a time scale. Yep. It's about 100 years. So the global warming potential of methane is more significant. It's got low warming potential at 25 to 1. So net like-to-like -like emissions of whatever quantity of CO2 you emit, the equivalent of global warming potential is 4% of methane. Over 500 years, that's far less. That really is. That's the important point. Over 500 years, it's not as much as that. Okay, but if we're looking at this here over 25 years, or 10 years, or 5 years, then this actually feeds into how well we understand that. And when we're making decisions about what we should do, I think this is quite important. So, so the fact that we're actually starting to debate this now even shows that these are areas that we would like to have better answers to. 
Right. So then how do we actually do that? Because it's very really difficult for the research community to get money to allow us to have ongoing and prolonged research programmes. And, and therefore we're wondering if there is scope to start exploring the concept that if you're making a difference to what is a terrestrial carbon store, should you actually then be investing in better understanding some of the questions that we don't have answers to? And there is perhaps, um, there are examples of basically where there is national reinvestment, I'm calling it, for anthropogenic use of natural resources. And the two examples that I put up here are the aggregates levy, where money is charged at a fixed <coughs> amount per tonne of the aggregate extracted. And a proportion of this green levy goes into an aggregates levy sustainability fund to support projects to encourage green strategies. And then another one which is not um, exactly comparable, but in this way of thinking, could be considered the landfill tax, which is charged by weight. So um, basically these um, people receive a credit for the proportion of tax that they send. The landfill operators receive a credit for the proportion of tax that they send to the government. And this can then be donated to all the organisations. Okay, so, so, so it's basically use of natural resources that's then reinvested in a way that's supposed to be a social benefit. And we're suggesting that actually, or I don't know if we are suggesting, this is what we want to discuss, what we're saying is that maybe if you're going to develop this carbon-rich landscape, this also represents a natural resource and it's slow to accumulate carbon reservoir. So should we actually have associated with that the need to generate income that then feeds back and answering some of the questions so that we can move the debate forward at a quicker rate than we would do if we didn't have research funding available. And then what's come out recently is the wind farm and peatlands good practice um, principles and these principles are basically designed to support further dialogue, not to provide detailed information that's more appropriate to informal planning and other statutory guidance on wind farms. And there are two principles here, principle three and four, which I've expanded on the next slide because it quite, might be quite difficult to read. But principle four um, is basically saying that where possible, the renewables industry will engage with stakeholders to provide support for applied research into key areas of peatland science relevant to understanding the impacts of development on the various people and qualities, including biodiversity, carbon, and hydrology. And principle three says that they will assist in improving the knowledge base on the impacts of development in peatland and the effectiveness of peatland rehabilitation through putting in place scientific monitoring and sharing of data with other stakeholders where appropriate. And several times over the past couple of days, the discussions come up about the fact that there may be data sitting there that if we have access to, it could be a very good research resource that could move some discussion further on um, than exists at present. And our experience within CLAD, and we have a, a reasonable body of work working on what I call landscape resilience and adaptation to hosting wind farms, <coughs> is that the investment in research has actually been borne by a few, but the results are going to be a benefit to everyone. And we wondered if that's actually fair that this should be carried by a few organisations that are prepared to put up funding and instead a levy that might be, for instance, a portion to the size of the development in the peatland would actually be a fairer way of distributing some kind of responsibility for, for research. Um, however, this is called carbon landscapes and drainage. It's not called the impacts of wind farms and peatlands. And the focus always ends up coming back to the wind farms because of all the levels of sense of ownership there is about whether there should or should not be a wind farm and we're ignoring the fact that there are other processes going on that are effectively disturbing these carbon rich landscapes as well. So this is in Scotland and we don't have the extent of industrial extraction that Catherine has told us about that takes place in Ireland but these are two examples of current peat cutting that take place not far from that wall wind farm and um, effectively this image is in 2005 but I drive this road frequently to Blacklaw Wind Farm and these sites are still active in terms of peat cutting. But we haven't engaged yet with the people <coughs> in the UK that are extracting peat industrially. So we mentioned <coughs> coal the other day as well. Yeah? Yep. So we're extracting carbon from our landscape in terms of coal. And to get often to quarrying, there's overburden that is removed as well, and that overburden can actually be peat that's extracted. If we burn the heather deep enough, then we're actually getting down to um, oxidising some of the carbon that's stored in the soil there. We have roads, so we saw the Rodex yesterday, and the examples that are given at the back of the Rodex documents 
and in the Rodex programme we're all, all actually about road building on the sort of peatland type landscape. <coughs> and um, if anyone's been up the M90 over the past few months, they would, 80, sorry, M80, I keep getting it wrong, they would have seen that there's a reasonable amount of carbon rich soils there that have been um, removed effectively to implement roads that we all want to use and access. And then also there's likely to be housing developments. That's probably not going to be a large component of it because people would have drainage problems if they're going to build on peaks. But one of the things that we should have through efforts of people like Macaulay and various other bodies that have been mentioned to do research are maps of carbon density that we can start identifying where at-risk areas are. So if there's a development that's about to take place on a carbon-rich landscape, we could assess effectively whether it is likely to have a significantly deleterious effect on the capacity of that landscape to store carbon and how much carbon may be lost. So then what would be the advantage of actually funding research through such a levy is that we actually still believe that if we have information we can provide answers that would actually save hours discussing complex questions. Okay? Um, but the time scale over which we generate understanding is quite long. So Mark was the last person to talk and he gave an example of his research that's been carrying out over the past few <coughs> years. He would need probably six months to get up to speed with the skill training, at least a year to collect an annual budget, and then ideally another year to see whether what is looked at is an exceptional year <coughs> or not. So we don't necessarily provide answers very quickly, and this is why as scientists we're always trying to think about how can we embark upon sustained research programs so that we accommodate um, inter-annual variability. And the thing about research is it's not the same as commissioning a review. Well, commissioning a review can certainly provide a research overview, but we're talking about research that's actually developing new knowledge rather than collating existing knowledge. The output may not be beneficial to all the interested parties. Okay? So it was very good of Nadine to come and share his data that showed that at the very localised scale there is an impact on nutrient concentrations in the water bodies because that's something that the Forestry Commission now have to accommodate in their practice. So research may not provide a positive answer, it may provide a negative answer to what you're looking at. And as Alona pointed out this morning, sometimes the studies give conflicting results. So one particular um, dream walking um, scenario may provide one set of understanding, and if you go to a different catchment where the soil is different, the slope is different, or it's done slightly differently, you might have a different understanding. So sometimes it does have to be very site specific. And research can require monitoring, but we have to differentiate that it's not the same as monitoring. Okay, we might be able to accommodate monitoring in research programs, but we're not undertaking monitoring programs unless they have a research value to them. So I've kind of made a pitch to get the conversation going on to why I think there's actually some rationale for starting to consider this. And then I've come up with what I think might be suitable discussion points, but at this point it really becomes open to the floor um, for you to comment in any way you think fit. But the kind of things we could discuss are what are the benefits of such a levy and what are the disadvantages. And then if you ever got beyond that kind of discussion, if it was if there was such a levy and it was implemented, what should it be used for? How do we quantify the value of it? And who should actually calculate this? And who would actually administer it? So where would this fund sit? Who would benefit? And what areas of research would actually be covered? And then I'm going to go back to these questions and leave them up as our discussion points, but I just want to throw in some ideas that I had. So where would the fund sit? Perhaps a discussion executive. Okay, who would benefit? Well, it's a levy on Scottish um, activities, then maybe Scottish research institutes should benefit from it. What areas of research? Ideally, would it be better right investment to answer generic and not site specific questions, with the caveat that research can be site specific? And if it was for wind farm related research, then given that this good practice guide has been defined, we've already identified areas that they think investment should be in if it takes place, and that would be biodiversity, carbon, and hydrology. And then something else that we might want to think about is that maybe we actually would pull resources and have an experimental site, which is scientists we're always advocating and it's really difficult to get. But if you can bring together all the different people that are working on biodiversity, carbon function, gas and flux, um, and other aspects that I'm not so aware of, and have their research layering upon one another, we move forward the understanding so much faster than someone doing biodiversity at one site 
carbon research on other sites. And perhaps then any investment that was made in that site would be retained by whatever management structure is in place at the site. So the equipment wouldn't belong to a particular body that carried out that research. It would be there for the benefit of people coming in in the future so that you're maximising um, the use of any investment that there may be for a research levy. Okay, so I said I would do just some comments that I put in to start the ball rolling and then I said I would leave these questions back up here and open the floor up <coughs> to discussion now. So I'm just switching the lights and then we'll just get it going. Dave, still here? I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Cheers. Pardon? Come on, Can I'm going to help chair this, am I? And also we said on the, what we plan to do with this is um, write up comments from what everyone has said. And Simon's filming this just so we can get a record of it. If anyone's very unhappy with the comments being noted on the film, that's okay. We won't make this public. So we would have to be happy if people are happy to be involved in this discussion to make it public. But what we'd like to do with this is write up the perspectives as we understand it and then distribute it back out for everyone to look at. <coughs> and then at that point, depending on what opinions come through, it may be taken further and in what direction yet 